This video is about enabling and using interrupts on the Pico RV32 RISC-V soft core running on a mini SOC on the Tang Nano 9K FPGA development board. The project also supports the Tang Nano 20K. We'll show both the Verilog and the software for both an external interrupt and for instructions that generate interrupts. For the external interrupt, we will connect one of the onboard push buttons, so this project needs nothing but the Tang Nano board. There are no external components. It turns out that the Pico RV32 has a couple of idiosyncrasies that you must watch out for. As usual, the Pico RV32 website on GitHub has a README that contains good documentation. So if I scroll down in this, we'll see the README and it has a table of contents. So we can take a look at Verilog module parameters. There are several that are associated with interrupts. So we'll scroll down a little bit. And these two, we have catch misalign and catch illegal instruction. If you leave these at their defaults, which I think you should, those will cause misaligned loads and stores to cause an interrupt and also illegal instructions will cause an interrupt. And then we'll scroll down further and we come to the key parameter. This is enable IRQ. So you have to change it to one from its default of zero to enable IRQs in the first place. And then this next one is also important, and I think you should leave it as its, as its default. What it does is it enables uh, some additional non-standard registers that are accessed using some non-standard instructions. So these are registers and instructions that are not in the RISC-V specification. The uh, Pico RV32 does not conform to the standard in interrupt processing. That's just the way it is. But anyway, so these queue registers are accessed by these non-standard get queue and set queue instructions. And then there are some other additional non-standard instructions as well that we'll talk about. Let's see, this next one enables the non-standard timer instruction to produce an interrupt. This timer counts down, and when it transitions from one to zero, it can generate an interrupt if this is enabled. And then there's masked IRQ. So a one bit in this position permanently disables IRQs in the corresponding positions. By the way, there are 32 total interrupts. I don't think I said that. Latched IRQ, we'll talk about this in detail later. It's one of the idiosyncrasies. It's supposed to distinguish between edge-triggered interrupts and level-triggered interrupts, but I don't think it actually does that. So we'll, we'll talk about it later. And then this is the address of the IRQ handler and software. So I'm leaving it to its default of 10 hex. And uh, this is the the address of the first fetch when the part comes out of reset. So I'm leaving it as its default of zero. Now we're scrolled down to the section in the readme called custom instructions for IRQ handling. And this describes the additional non-standard instructions that exist for allowing software to handle interrupts on the Pico RV32. And um, we'll talk about the signals later. But, but one thing is the first three of the interrupt signals sort of do double duty. You can cause interrupts to occur, by driving those signals, but, but these first ones are also triggered by instructions. So IRQ0 is the one that will fire when, when the timer instruction that we'll talk about expires. And e-brake, e-call, or illegal instruction uh, trigger IRQ1. E-brake and e-call are associated with doing things like system calls and operating systems. And then bus error, uh, IRQ2, triggers on unaligned memory accesses. Now let's scroll down and take a look at the special instructions. The first two are get queue and set queue, and those exist to allow software to copy data between the regular RISC-V registers and the four special queue registers. So they're simple enough, but vital for the processing of interrupts. Return from IRQ is what software runs to signify that it's done handling an exception. And so what this does is causes a return to the normal processing of the regular software. And it does that essentially by branching to the address stored in Q0. But executing this instruction also tells the hardware that the interrupt handling is complete. And mask IRQ acts a little bit strange. We'll talk about it a little bit more later, but its purpose is to allow software to dynamically determine which interrupts are enabled and which are disabled. Wait IRQ allows you to wait for an interrupt. I actually haven't tested that one. And a timer is a special instruction that when you provide it a value in register X2 will count down from that value to zero. And upon the transition from one to zero, it can trigger an interrupt. 
and it actually puts the old value of the counter in X1. This diagram shows the Pico RV32's interrupt processing flow. When hardware sees one or more of the IRQ signals go high, it sets the Q0 register to the current program counter, sets each IRQ's corresponding bit in Q1 to 1, making a bit mask of IRQ's to be handled, and for each triggered IRQ, it sets the corresponding EOI signal to high, indicating back to hardware that software is starting to process the interrupt. Hardware is free to use this signal or not. My example doesn't need it. Then, software takes over. It must save the processor state, meaning registers, to memory so registers can be used for interrupt processing, and then look at Q1 to see what IRQs must be processed. The software must process all of them. So then, it processes them. Software can set up a stack and call a C function to handle the interrupts. That's what I do. When done, that C function returns. Software then restores the register states from memory, including ensuring that Q0 still contains the address at which processing must resume. Next, software does a RET IRQ instruction, and hardware takes over again. Hardware then sets the EOI signals low, indicating that software is done processing the interrupts, and it resumes instruction fetching at the address in Q0. Here's the hardware. Note that when button 2 is pressed, it triggers IRQ3. Now, let's see it in action. I've loaded the image on the Tang Nano 9K, so if I press its reset button, we'll see something on the terminal window here on the left. And if I type HE, the software gives a list of commands that are supported in this image. The interrupt handlers simply keep a count of interrupts, and the PI command lists those counts. So, so far, there haven't been any interrupts since the reset. The TI command with an argument like 6 does a timer instruction with value 6, which then immediately counts down to 0 and generates a timer interrupt, which we can see. Now that's 1. Um, II does an illegal instruction, and I'll show you how the software does that later. So PI, and now we have an illegal instruction. EI does a misaligned access. So now we have a misaligned access. And if I press button 2 and release it, and then do a PI, we should see an IRQ3. I'll do a second one of those, and we see another IRQ3 from the button. Now, let's try masking. So remember, we've only seen one timer interrupt. So if I do an MI1, that will mask the first interrupt, that, which is the timer. And so now, if I do a second timer interrupt like that, and I do a PI, if the interrupt weren't masked, we would see a second timer interrupt, but we don't. And so now here's the strange thing. If I unmask that interrupt by doing an MI0 and then do a PI, now we see that second timer interrupt. And what that means is that the masking is masking the delivery of the interrupt, but, not, but, but still leaving it pending. So as soon as you unmask the interrupt, the interrupt gets delivered. So that's good to know. Now let's go over to the Verilog. So this is the uh, top level module. And so towards the top of it, we set the IRQ parameters like we discussed. So IRQ is enabled, Q regs are enabled. And also notice that all of the interrupts are set to be latched. So this is all working, but let me scroll down to the uh, bottom of the file near where Pico RV32 is instantiated and show you what I had to do to make this work. So in particular, I had to introduce a new module that I'm calling Edge Finder and button two is the signal coming from the button. And what this module does is that it watches that signal for a rising edge. And when it sees one, it creates a one clock pulse. And it's button two pulse that I actually connect to IRQ3. Let's see what happens if I connect button two directly. And I would do that by changing this code down here to connect button two to IRQ3. But the uh, button on the Tang Nano 9K goes low when you press it, so I need to negate. The uh, module does that when I'm using Edge Finder. So now let's build and see what happens. This will take a little bit of time. And now the build's done, so we load the project. All right, do a PI, and we see no interrupts. So now if I press the button for the IRQ3, and release it, I see a ton of interrupts. So that doesn't look right. So what's going on? To get an idea, let's go back to the Pico RV32 website and carefully read 
the definition of latched I or Q. Remember, that's what we have configured. And so what that says is that a one in this bit mask indicates that the corresponding I or Q is latched when the I or Q line is high for only one cycle. So that's talking about it triggering when it detects the signal being high. It does not say that the signal is triggered or captured on a rising edge. So I think it's doing exactly what it says. And the button on the Tang Nano boards, when you, when you press it, it's, it actually stays in that state for quite a while. So what's happening is that an interrupt is occurring and being handled. And then the uh, interrupt handling routine terminates. And immediately a second interrupt is detected because that signal is still high. And so when this documentation talks about this being an edge triggered interrupt, I don't think that's true. I think it's literally a sort of high latched interrupt. And so my edge finding module converts it to a true edge triggered interrupt. And so that's what I needed to do to make it work. And I think that's going to be needed whenever you have signals that might stay high for a long time. And one last comment. I think if you're trying to do a level sensitive interrupt instead of an edge triggered one, then setting latch to zero would work fine. From a Verilog point of view, you can see that enabling interrupts is pretty simple. You just use the parameters to turn on interrupts and connect signals. It's really more of a software task, and we'll talk about that next. But, but before switching to the software, I want to show you one more thing in the Verilog. So I'll open this new Edge Finder module, and you can see some conditional compilation. Since my previous videos, I've rearranged the source code, both Verilog and software, so that a single code base supports both the Tang Nano 9K and the Tang Nano 20K. You'll see that more in the software. The software build process actually drives the setting of the parameters. It chooses whether you're building for the 9K or the 20K. And I have separate Gowan IDE projects for, for the 9K and the 20K that'll both be in the GitHub. There'll be a link below. This is the project directory. So you can see the two go in project files, but the software is in directory C code. And in there, most of the interrupt support is, is in file startup.s. So we can take a look at that. And the first thing you see is custom ops.s being included. And custom ops.s is a file from the Pico RV32 website that, can, that allows the non-standard instructions to be used from the assembler. So you see a couple of, of examples of that here. So that's a handy file. And otherwise, this area here, start, this is where software starts when the part comes out of reset. And then here, um, 16 bytes in at, at address hex 10 is the IRQ vector. So when an, when an interrupt happens, this code starts to execute. And the first thing it's doing is just saving registers to an area of memory that's been allocated for that purpose and no other purpose. And then eventually, it has to make a call to an IRQ function written in C. But before it does that, it has to set up a stack pointer. It uses a special interrupt stack using some more reserved memory. And let's see, like, for example, right here is where it passes Q1, which contains the mask of interrupts to be serviced. It puts that into the standard register that makes it available to the C function. So the C function does its stuff, returns, and then code continues here, restoring the registers until it gets to the point where it does a return from IRQ instruction. And that completes the processing of the interrupt. But next we should look at the C code. The C IRQ function is in file main.c. So let's take a look at that. And we'll just search for IRQ open parent to find it. And so you can see this thing is really a very simple function. The bit mask of interrupts to be serviced is here in IRQs. So all this code does is check each one and keep a count. So it really couldn't be simpler. Earlier, I mentioned functions for doing things like doing an illegal instruction. Let's take a quick look at that. So we'll find it like this, I think. So there is that function. So that's done using an asm volatile to a special mnemonic that's a standard for RISC-V assemblers called unimplemented. And so that guarantees that you do an illegal instruction. And here's the function that does a bus error. So it just conspires to use a to do a load half word of a misaligned address. Ah, and also we see here a function like do mask IRQ instruction. And so that's how you can set the mask dynamically on the fly. And it actually makes a call to this function here, which is in startup.s. It's at the bottom of startup.s. We could take a quick look at that. So that's very simple because 
It just conforms to the calling convention for RISC-V C functions. A0 is the first parameter and also the return address. So that's how these are done. We can go back to main.c. And let's look at how these functions are actually called in the C code. So if I look for illegal again, you can see there's this table. And this is a table that the command parser uses. So it takes two two letter commands. And when it, when it finds, when you type the correct two letters, it calls this the function pointer associated with the two letters. So it makes it very easy to add new commands to the command parser. And then let's look at a build. So I'll go over to this window here. And so in order to build for either the 9K or the 20K, you should probably do a make clean first that makes sure that everything's out of the way for building for the other board. So when you switch which board you're working on, do a make clean. But then to do the build for a particular board, just do either make 9K or make 20K. And that's the build. It doesn't take long at all. And so this creates these files in the Verilog source directory that um, contain the program. And so those get baked into the Verilog using those include files. So that's how the build process works. I made another significant change in unifying the code base for the 9K and the 20K. Now, both the 9K and the 20K use the RPLL to generate the system clock, assuming a 27 MHz input to the RPLL. This means that on the 20K, the external clock generator must be set to 27 MHz. The clock speed is selected by editing the software make file. The build process automatically computes the RPLL multipliers and dividers to achieve the desired clock speed. See the readmes and the software make file for more on this. So, that's how to use interrupts on the Pico RV32. I'll put a link below to the new GitHub that supports both the Tang Nano 9K and the 20K. I'll also show below how to check out the correct tag to get the code for this video. Later videos will use later tags. I hope you enjoyed this video, and thanks for watching.